Okay. So when we started out, you know, both of us were fairly idealistic in our careers. You know, we started out with the idea that, you know, things should be all nice and clean, right? Design, uh, I come from an electrical engineering background, you know, so I was thinking that, you know, things should be awfully, you know, clean and there, everything should be nice and organized, you know, and, you know, even software should be this way, you know, because this is, you know, this is a fairly mature discipline even after, you know, 50 years or so. Yeah, like we're basically idealists. We like to see things nice and clean. This was kind of my view coming out into the world. I expected to see servers that are all beautifully cabled, all nicely done. I expected to see software done really very well. And I kind of hoped that would be the way the world is. But this is actually a lot more what was the world that I kind of come out and appeared in. And it even gets worse than that. Yeah, some systems are absolutely scary. And this is not just random things picked off the web. Over 10 years ago, I joined a startup, and we had a server room, and we went into it, and it did not look dissimilar to this. We had no idea which machines had which IP addresses. The way we worked it out is we wrote some software that tortured the disk, and we run around listening to the different servers to work out which IP addresses were which machines. It was that bad. But it even gets worse than that. You know, sometimes we're even proud of certain solutions. You, know, you look at some software and people are doing these sorts of things and they're proud of it almost. We should be ashamed of some of what we do in software. This is crazy stuff. But let's look at how bad this can really be for our industry. Let's look at some metrics. So what are we looking at here? Sort of successful, challenged, and failure. So a successful project is a project that succeeds on time, budget, and return on investment. A failure is failing on two and challenge is filling on one. What do we and, see? Yeah, when we look at some of these numbers, I think there's a couple things that stand out. Uh, the, the first thing is, is that, you know, ad, from the difference between ad hoc and iterative and agile, there's not a big difference. I mean, there is definitely a difference, but it's not that big. You know, we would think that there would be a much different, you know, and, there, and that would be much different compared to as much as we talk about agile and how bad we usually put down waterfall. It actually isn't, it's kind of trailing, but Eh, it's not that bad. But when you look at the failure rates, you know, even Agile itself, 12%, you know, is total outright failure. That should be somewhat surprising to us. Yeah, let's look at it from a few other dimensions. Look at it by team size. Like things are actually quite good with small teams, but it starts getting rapidly bad as teams increase. So as we go for large teams, this is not a good thing to look at. And actually as teams get larger, the difference between approaches actually stops mattering you start converging on a point where the failure rates are almost likely to happen. And we think about that, you know, there may be something to Amazon's two pizza rule, right? Where you have small, you know, smaller teams that are doing much more. You know, this, this kind of lends, lends some credence to that. Yeah, so those were some of the good studies. It can get worse than that. Here's one from the Standish Chaos Report in 2010, where we're only looking at less than a third of projects succeeding. This is not a good place to be. Yeah, we wouldn't want to get on a plane if there was a 33% chance that we're going to get there, right? I mean, <laughs> let's think about that for a moment. So, you know, we should be thinking about that in sort of the same situation. Let's look at it by money. As projects go up in cost, the likelihood of failure is going up in cost as well. This is, again, not very good. What if we go to some of the larger scales? So this is like your typical corporate project where you're spending sort of 15 million plus. Here's a study of over so 1,500 or 5,400 projects, and we're getting to the point where 17% go so badly, they have threatened the existence of the company that undertook them. Now, we're not just talking minor failure, we're talking about taking out the company. This is not a good place to be, and this is a 2012, so this is, this is recent stuff, and we think we're getting better at this. So what are we gonna do here today? Our industry's in a bit of a mess. <laughs> we kind of arrived in this as two idealists, and we keep seeing there's a lot of sacred cows, there's a lot of dogma, there's a lot of ideology going around in our industry. We want to take on some of those subjects. And so I'm trying to pick some holes in them and see if there's any sort of way forward. So especially since in Chicago and sort of you get a good stake around here, let's cut up some cows. So let's start off enterprise software. This is nice and easy at this end. Let's look at the word itself. Yeah, when you think of enterprise software, do you think of things like difficult and, you know, many people and dangerous and new ways of doing things? 
But that's actually what the term works like. But if you think about it in a little bit different in terms of enterprise, actually it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially whenever sort of we're going to kill the company that we're actually working for. So maybe <laughs> enterprise is a good choice here. So this naming really matters, and it's a theme that keeps coming up on our industry. You know, names program behaviors. We need to think about this. So, like, so naming is one of the hardest problems in our industry, but we still don't seem to crack it. We need to get better at this. For example, we use the architect. Yeah, the architect, you know, especially the enterprise architect, right? Sort of setting up on high, going the thou shalt use IBM, thou shalt use Oracle, things <laughs> like that. And um, you know, a lot of times, do they actually do any code? Do they actually contribute you know, to a project in a fundamental, you know, physical way by actually building part of it? Sometimes, yeah, but ever increasingly, that's the role that architects are being pulled out of. You know, they're making decisions and designs, but they're actually not following through in building. Yeah, so Dave made a point in introducing us. Something that we both care passionately about is open source. And I think open source in many ways is a game changer. And why it's a game changer is we get to see real work. So you go back to the architect example, we can go and see their buildings, we can walk and live in their buildings, we can see what they've done. Generally, we don't see this with code. Open source changes that. When it comes to things like recruitment, we can see other people's code, and it can be a lot better when it's done this way. So there's some wonderful reasons for this. When I was at LMAX, I led our technical PR program, and open source was part of that. One of the most important things to why we did that was recruitment. It wasn't because we wanted to be altruistic and just give this out to the world. I needed to recruit people. I didn't have the budget to pay them huge salaries. I didn't have the equity to give out stock in that way. So what was the best way to get good people into the company? Well, show them that you do good things and show them that you're working on great work. And that's where the disruptor and other stuff came out from. We just wanted to show that you can do good things in our company. It was probably the most successful thing we did for recruitment. It's a really useful technique. And it also has another side effect. You know, the light of day gets rid of a lot of sense, right? When you have your work out there, and you, you know, even after years that you might have contributed on an open source project, and it's still up there you know, in, in uh, Google Code or GitHub now, you know, different things like that, you know, your work lives on in that way. And people can look at it, and they can you know, see if you've improved. You know, and it even goes to the part where open source projects are actually part of you know, your resume now, right? Someone can go to GitHub and see the different projects you committed to and look at your work. I mean, and there's actually even organizations that specialize in finding people with specific skills by analyzing you know, your, their GitHub contributions. So you know, it's awfully hard to hide anymore. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. I, I had this one email about two years ago, which was hilarious, where some guy sent me this email. Subject line was, you're a fake. Oh, oh God, this is going to be good. I went in and said, I looked at your GitHub history. And some of the stuff that you do early on is really not very good. OK, it looks OK later on. And I started thinking, does this person not get what learning's about? <laughs> we actually make mistakes. We get better with time. And so it's just something broken in our industry. We think we're going to do all this upfront planning, big design, and we're going to be right. Well, we're not. That's part of the reason we've got a lot of these failures that are out there. Let's go back to the enterprise software thing for a moment. So product managers. You know, a lot of times in an enterprise software organization, act as a surrogate, you know, for the customer. You know, they they sort of filter what is coming in from the, you know, the, from customers in the field, and they are also the ones who a lot of times, you know, message back to the field. You know, the sales team. Do we really want a surrogate for the customer? I mean, if, I, I th always thought that, you know, I'd like to talk to the customer itself and get that straight from them because I don't want a filter. I want to know the good, the bad, and especially the ugly. You know. Yeah, I want to get out there. I've done all sorts of weird things, including sat on a desk in a service center taking calls when I was writing service center software. You get to know what it's all about. You work with the people who actually use your software. You learn a whole lot more. Like, we talk about the minimum viable product. It's like, do we want to build these things that are just the minimum viable thing? Like most people sort of are picking something that no one wants as an end use. We want to make software that's excellent for the end users. OK, we want it to be the smallest slice of what's useful for them, but let's make this excellent. I think also part of the anti-pattern here is the product owner. We're going to pick a bit on Agile here, because like, what I keep seeing is a pattern happening in the real world. We've got product owner in the team. What is the product owner? The person that the business can do without that they can give you your project. <laughs> yep. That is not good. <laughs> These people are not going to be telling you the exact right thing to build. Not a good place to be. We kind of say, go back, you're going the wrong way with this. 
The thing is, technologists, we are part of the business. We have this problem of the them and us, and it's as much our problem as that. We are just so subservient to the business. We've got to get out, we've got to work with them, we've got to help them. We've got to stop using these terms like, we're solving their problems, we're fixing things for them. Well, we should be working with them. This is the programming behavior by using the words. We've got to think differently about this. Right. And we really need to take responsibility for ROI ourselves, right? We, we need to actually look at what the investment is, see if it's how we would want to spend that money, right? Is it really the minimum viable product? It, or is it going to be the product that we actually want to build, right? And that's why we need that access to the, you know, the customers directly. It's why we need that tight feedback cycle, you know, so, so that it's the only way that we can do this is actually by having that. It's kind of interesting, so why are we doing this and why are we so making some of our decisions? I keep seeing this over again, people are randomly trying stuff and they're just wasting the money of the company, they're wasting the money of the project. You should be looking at what do we want to achieve, what answer do we need to a question and how do I find that out for the minimum investment? These are the sort of ways you've got to be thinking if you want to get on well with the business and actually start solving things in the right way. So sticking in the latest piece of technology that looks good on your resume or good on your CV is not solving the problem. Unfortunately, we were living in this era of what I call resume-driven development. And it's partly the problem to do with our recruitment and how we go on about it. We don't look for people who solve the, the real business problems and come up with solutions. We look for who's got such and such a framework and such and such a language. And it's just not the right way to be going. Right. If you were spending your own money, you'd do this differently. Oh, oh agile. I can pick on this for a while. <laughs> so a lot of times, you know, agile is sort of done as a way of playing house and mm. you need some adult supervision, right? Sort of go through the motions, doing what you've been told you need to do, not really sure exactly how to do it well, yeah. but you kind of still go through the motions and try to make it seem like you're agile. Yeah, I keep coming across teams like this and they really do look like they're playing house. People are going through these motions, but what are they actually doing? What are they trying to solve? Like, this is a really good pattern of a water scrum fall. So what people are doing is they're having the daily stand-ups, but they're releasing once every six months or once a year. They've got nothing that's doing the feedback cycles for them. They're just playing these games because, again, it's resume-driven development. We've got to look at what really mm -hmm. matters here. And what Agile is about and Lean's about underneath, it's actually coming from the scientific method. It's about focusing on how we learn. It's focusing on the feedback cycles. It's focusing on outcomes. It's not focusing on the daily stand-up. If the daily stand-up is not getting you closer to your outcome, you should not be doing it. You people, we must do daily stand-ups. No, you don't have to do daily stand-ups. If they help you get to your end goal, do them. But you should be focusing on what your end goal is. And that's what's important with the likes of Agile, focusing on those outcomes. But there's an uncomfortable truth that we all know about the development, and especially all, all of us that have worked in even you know, small teams. Mm -hmm. And it's very true in large teams. Yeah, I, I consult all over the world. I've consulted in many companies, and I keep finding the same pattern happens over and over again, is one or two people are responsible usually for the success of a software project. And it's got nothing to do with the stand-ups. It's got nothing to do with the methodology. It's one or two people are willing to do what is necessary to get things done. Yeah, and it revolves around passion and pride a lot of times, right? Or even just frustration, you know, a couple meetings are happening, someone gets, or even you, you get frustrated that nothing's happening and you just take it on your shoulders and do it. I mean, we've all been there, right? We've all seen that or we've all been that person. And that a lot of times is what separates a good project from a eh, mediocre project. Pride, passion, and just the desire to get things done. Todd has definitely been that person. I remember a couple of years ago talking on Skype. We've worked together sort of independently, but we haven't worked in the same company together. And we're chatting on Skype at one stage, and Todd's telling me about how he's in this bug triage meeting and how they're all discussing how to solve the problem and planning into the future. And he just solves the problem in the meeting by actually, the good thing about laptops and Wi-Fi is you can go to some of these boring meetings and actually get some real work done now where people just play a house. You've got to just focus on solving the problem itself. It's kind of interesting. So one of the things I have done a lot is recruit people. And you'll get all the normal nonsense about how to recruit. In my mind, there's always one question. And sometimes I ask this question directly to people. Sometimes I do it in a roundabout thing. What you want to know from people is if they weren't on that project or they weren't in that company, what would have been different? 
How did they make a material difference? And that usually tells you a lot about have you found that person that makes the difference, the person that actually matters. Yeah, and it's not only what they say, it's actually how they say it. And, yes. and, and the tone and the, the facial expression and the body language and all mm -hmm. that gives you a definite sense of a lot of different things just from that one question. Ha. <laughs> Where's this we, kind of going? Yeah, go on. So we've got a lot of manifestos. We've seen the Agile manifesto. Like, there's a bit of an interesting backlash against going through our waterfall project. There's lots of other things coming out and lots of other things we've been kind of seeing. Just recently, we've seen the NoTCP, and I think Todd had some views on that when he's seen it. Yeah, the NoTCP manifesto uh, is, is really interesting and pre you know, presents a lot of things that I totally agree with. And there's a few things in there that are definitely sarcasm and satire, but there's actually really good pieces to it. So there's, you know, there's some good and some not so good questionable parts. You know. But there's also the reactive manifesto, which you had no small part in. <laughs> I didn't intend to get involved in it. Although it's kind of interesting getting involved in some of these things. Because what actually came out to me, why did I get involved in the reactive manifesto? Because a lot of food's kind of new. A uh, little bit of history. I got a background in martial arts and I changed in JKD, which was Bruce Lee's style. But what was kind of interesting is Bruce Lee was famous for innovating in martial arts more than anyone probably in history and how he moved stuff forward. But he didn't focus just on innovation to begin with. And he used to get really frustrated with students who just wanted to learn the, the silver bullet, the magic technique, whatever it was going to be. What he made a really strong point of, and to the point where he actually got rid of all of his students except six at one point, which you've got to focus on mastering the fundamentals before you then start playing with things, before you start changing things, before you start doing it differently. We are not doing the building on the shoulders of giants in our industry. It's something we've got to get a lot better at. And also the idea of you know, sort of fake it till you make it, mm -hmm. it's kind of antithesis of this, right? You, you really can't fake it when you, you, know, you don't know the, when you, you have to fake it when you don't know the fundamentals, but you can't really do that and move forward. No. So let's just get into a bit of actual technology itself. Let's sort of rent a little bit about the software stuff. Technology itself keeps seeing shared mutable state. We build systems, we have lots and lots of threads, and we have trying to protect this with locks and all this other sort of goodies and stuff like this. But this should be one of the most feared things we have in our industry. Some people will tell you it's the way to do it. In fact, it's the common way, especially in Java. We, we play with this shared mutable state all of the time. Yeah, and, and when you think about this, you know, we have compilers that reorder statements, we have CPUs that reorder you know, execution, you know, and we have memory models and everything else that make this hard. When you have multiple threads that are trying to access the same thing, it's very difficult to actually reason about. And it's even harder to enforce particular It's a complete actions. nightmare, even with really, really good people. And I've helped on a lot of these sorts of things. And kind of like obligatory sort of cute cat picture for a second. It is like herding cats when you start having multiple threads mutating the same state. I have not come across any multi-threaded program where people are mutating the same state that isn't bug-ridden. And I mean that by even some of the best people in the world. This is just such a hard thing to do. And people head off down this road, they create multi-threaded programs, they all start banging on the same state, and after a while you just look at the code. Yeah, you feel a little sheepish when you look at it, a little uncomfortable because you're not exactly sure what's going on. It's hard to reason about. These, and a lot of times they only get more complex as you try to add things to them. It's, it's a total nightmare. I'd argue shared mutable state should only be used by system programmers. And people may even put it forward a case, like I had this great discussion with Gil before, and he goes, yeah, but what about a cache? Do you want to have a normal program on a project developing a cache, since it's probably one of the hardest problems in computer science? That is system level programming as well. I have not found any single example where you'd want shared mutable state being manipulated by people on the same project and it's a good idea. This is a normal business style project. It is a system level program even problem. And if we think about this from, you know, sort of Conway's law, right, would you want a whole bunch of things that are, you know, being manipulated by different people within the organization as well? No, that's not going to work from a business no. sense either. All meddling. So what's the answer? Well, there is other techniques. 
We can look at things like append only structures. We can have single writer. Shared multi designs are the answer to that. This is how we work. Like all the people in this room, we don't have a single mind that we're all trying to work at. We've all got our own copy of the world from a modeling perspective, and we all communicate by passing messages. There's a lot to be learned from nature and how we do this. We, don't, we shouldn't be inventing these silly things that we keep doing in the computing world, which just are very unnatural. And because they're unnatural, we can't even relate to them, right. and we get it all wrong. And if you don't, math will hunt you down. You know, that's not really something you can run away from. Uh, you know, no matter how hard you try, uh, no matter how smart you think you are, math will literally hunt you down across the galaxy if it needs to. <laughs> And, you know, and hunt you down and make you, uh, you know, yeah. uh, bow to its will. So the complexity is scary enough. Well, what is the math behind this? I guess many people will have heard of Amdahl's law. Who's heard of universal scalability law? Got a few people that work in Neil Gunther. So Amdahl, in his uh, plan to pedal mainframes, was pointing out that parallel computing is so hard because you get contention, and with the contention you get serialization point, and you're limited in your speed up the blue line here. Neil Gunther found from real world experiments that that blue line was a dream. You don't even get close to it. So this is, a, this is an idea of an algorithm where you've got only 5% of it is the sequential component. You then have to make that data coherent to all of the parties involved in it. And that coherence has the cost. It has to be included. And then after a while, the coherence starts to dominate and you start slowing down. Now, if we've got shared mutable state, this is the world you're looking at, and you cannot run away from this math. So if the complexity doesn't scare you, you've got to worry about the math because we will not go fast. So be ruthless in reducing complexity. You know, strive for simplicity. Strive for you know, uh, the elegance of something. You know, because the simpler something is, and the less it depends on, and the less it contends on, the faster it's going to go. And you're going to avoid you know, the math. You're going to actually be on the right side of that curve instead of the wrong side. So that's, you know, both Martin and I have a very good sense of, you know, when something gets too complex. How many times have you actually done a solution and you keep adding things to it and kind of make, keep complicating it and you get to a point and you just, and you stop and you go, is this the right direction? How many times do you actually listen to yourself and go, no, this is wrong. I have to start over. It has to be simpler than this. Martin and I do that constantly when we're working on stuff. And do it to each other. Because sometimes you don't realize you've gone yes. off that way. And actually, be very careful of pair programming because it's so easy to drag your pair down with exactly the same sort of group think. You need that external influence. You need to change it up. There is very few problems that are really complex. It's usually we come up with complex solutions to them. And when you find it hard, you're doing the wrong thing. You're going the wrong way. So let's look at something a little bit more fun. Text encoding. We keep doing this all the time. This is the source of one of the biggest performance problems I keep seeing in systems. Where we encode in all of these wonderful formats. Yeah, you know, Tim Bray is a wonderful individual, and you know, we do owe him a debt of gratitude for XML. We also should burn him at the stake for XML. <laughs> uh, you know, XML is kind of horrible in a lot of different senses. Uh, you know, so you know, we came up with JSON, which is you know a lot easier. We we get rid, rid of some tags and just get them down to a single character, which is great. Uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's still text, it's still encoded, you know, and we even look at this and if you've ever looked at the HTTP2 spec and some of the things that are actually in there, they st they're still text encoding, you know, for certain things like headers and how they're encoded and using base64. And when you have a group of people who know the HTTP1 spec and you know different things like that and they're sitting around and they're talking for an hour what an actual spec means for base64 because of a certain type of encoding that's been added to it, and they can't agree on the spec, there's something wrong. Very wrong. You know, but you know, usually people say, well, it's human readable, so that, you know, I, can, I can read it. Well, let's think about this for a second. It's encoded, you then print it to the screen, which decodes it and shows you this you know, encoded information in ASCII. Yeah, so all these internet protocols, we're basically running the internet in debug mode. Yeah, yeah. It's woefully inefficient. And the next thing is, you know, binary is hard to work with, which is always flabbergasting to me coming from an assembler and, you know, and, and C background. You know, actually, binary is the easier thing to work with. If I have to actually build a parser, which I've done several times, I hate that. <laughs> so it's a lot harder than just actually working with binary. I have a so view. shut up and stop whining, right? 
just, just do this. It's actually a lot easier. Even in languages like Java, it's a lot easier to work with. Even in JavaScript, it's actually easier to, easier to work with. It's kind of interesting. So we end up with all this unstructured data because we get obsessed with text. And we've got loggers that just take completely unformatted strings. So what we get is completely unformatted data that's unstructured, hard to understand, hard to deal with. We're creating this whole industry around this. And this whole industry is to deal with this big heap of crap. <laughs> if we actually structured this in some sort of sensible way, it would be a heck of a lot easier. And Dean wouldn't have a job. <laughs> have you ever actually looked at what some MapReduce jobs look like on Hadoop? Let me explain. You pull off text, you convert it into you know, binary, you do some operations on it, you know, then you write it out in text. Then you do the reduce stage where you read it in, convert it from text into binary, do some operations on that, and then write it back as text. How, what? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> yeah, like, what are we doing this? And there's much more to this. So, like, Todd knows a little bit about phones. Like, what happens when we put all these protocols on phones? Well, you want to keep your device out of a high energy state. And there's actually, you know, depending on the device, several different stages. So what you want is something which sends very little data, doesn't have to send, you know, for very long, and is fairly efficient. Well, guess what? Text is not a very, you know, easy way to send, you know, complex data. Think of sending XML versus sending JSON, right? It's much, much shorter. But guess what? It can be even shorter still. That keeps a phone, for example, or an IoT device out of a high energy state. So there's no reason to actually use text encoding when you're thinking, hey, I want to extend the battery life as much as possible. Do we want to be charging our phones every day? It's down to our lazy programming. There's a lot of that problem and why we're doing it. It gets worse, though. Uh, you know, we, we, we're kind of addicted. You know, synchronous communication makes things really easy. We've been doing this for a long time. You know, we started with local, local functions. Then we were like, hey, you know what? We can actually remotely put these at different places. All we have to do is put some networking between them. You know, and then we had RPC, and now we have REST, right? And it's kind of the same model, request response and synchronous request response. And, and the, the amount of time, you go back to the 1950s, there was some great work at IBM that actually pointed out that trying to do synchronous RPC was an anti pattern, and it was going to have this world of hurt come with it. And no one read the paper. And now we're starting to read this again after realizing. Uh, Steve Vinovsky done a great talk in Aarhus a couple of years ago where he'd gone through the whole of the, the past couple of decades of his work on Corba and RPC and all sorts of things, and the pain he went through, and then the light bulb moment that took him like two, year, or two decades later to work it out when he read this paper. We need to be doing things asynchronous. Because there's a kind of interesting problem with this in that if we assume a remote RPC call is going to work, you're just so wrong. You're so wrong on so many levels. It's going to fail, and bad stuff does happen. And once we've done this sort of coupling, we end up with this real problem. I've got a simple view on this. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's great, right? You use synchronous comms, you, you do something, now you're doing networking, and you're, you're all excited, right? So, you know, you get that buzz and that high. You know, and the next thing is, you know, you're, you know your family's having an intervention. You know, they're, th they're saying, look, you know, this is really bad for you. And you're like, no, no, this is great. And then your teeth start falling out, things like that. You know, it really is very addictive. Yeah, you should see the denial people are in about RPC. It's the same sort of behaviors with people who have addictions. It's wrong. It doesn't work. It starts off being easier, but it just keeps getting worse and it gets harder and harder. And there's a reason for this, and that is because it causes this coupling in location and time. This is down to the building on the fundamentals. Whereas if we decouple things in the time and we decouple them in the space, it makes it so much easier to deal with stuff. We can deal with systems failing. We can deal with pipelining for performance. We can batch. We can do so many great things. If we just decouple these things, it has to be asynchronous. And the first thing is, is that get out of the mindset of you know, errors being anything really special. Think of them as messages. Think of them as an event. Right? When you start doing this, you actually start thinking about it in a very different way that is actually a lot easier to handle. You know, because an error that happens on one side but has to be reflected in the logic on another machine, it has to be handled this way. You know, if you think about, even go back to, uh, you know, the way the internet works with ICMP and errors and how those work, they are messages. And they're handled just like a normal message by the infrastructure. It's how the endpoints actually manage them. Yeah. There's a great study that came out last year was showing like, like all of these failing projects, especially from a reliability perspective, the most common cause of failure in large-scale projects is poor exception handling. And then a lot of the studies that were showing the exception handlers were empty and never tested. 
Whereas if we make errors, first class things, and we pass them as messages, we just deal with them. This is where things like Rx is really good because we define how we deal with the messages and we have to define yes. how we deal with the errors. It's just there, it's in your face. It's a great way to be working. So the question is really, if you're thinking about and you're doing microservices and you're distributing things around, are, there, are they on meth? I mean, that's a good question, right? Are you relying on the synchronous comms you know, to, sim to su supposedly simplify your logic? A or is it just sort of making it look like that way? Yeah, so who's doing microservices with REST? You having fun yet? <laughs> So things that should have been together in a monolith, we're now breaking apart. Maybe there's good reasons to break them apart, but as soon as you break them apart, you need really good communications. And REST will cause you to couple on this. It's actually better than RPC, but it still is a synchronous protocol for dealing with these things. You go to messaging, it's going to get a lot easier, especially if you start moving forward to the microservices. Let's go back to that architect thing again. And, uh, you know, abstractions. You know, we even have sort of a law around, you know, leaky abstractions, right? And we kind of think that, you know, almost all useful abstractions, and I wouldn't even say non-trivial, are to some extent leaky. And this is because of Joel Spolsky has pointed out here, is the detail of underlying complexity cannot be ignored. This is really funny in that it actually shows a fundamental misunderstanding about what abstractions are. So we actually have a law to describe them, but wrongly. A much better way of looking at them is if you look at Dijkstra's opinion, and the whole purpose of abstracting is not to be vague. If you're not vague, you won't be having that underlying complexity leak out because you should be creating a new semantic level in which you're absolutely precise. Dijkstra said this in 1972 in his cheering acceptance speech. Most people in this room were probably not even born in 72, and yet we're not learning. We're playing with these sorts of abstractions. I think there's something else going on to why we're doing this with abstractions and why people are not understanding it. And we're, it's because they're committing these sins. Yeah, we're, we're kind of committed to building up these Baroque architectures and these Baroque solutions because sometimes it makes us feel important that only we understand it. Sometimes it's just we want to show off. Uh, you know, and sometimes we just, it got complicated because it, to solve the problem it got complicated. Yeah, this is the danger of smart people in computer science. They want to show off how smart they are. Even worse, smart men in computer science want to kind of leave a legacy. They want to leave their seed in some ways, and we end up with these Baroque things, and this becomes part of the problem. Like a really good example is ORMs. I hate ORMs. You take two perfectly good models. You've got object orientation, and you've got set theory, and you couple them together so neither of them can do a good job of what they do. And we use the excuses of, oh, well, I don't need to understand the database. I don't need to understand SQL. If you don't understand SQL and set theory, you should not be using a database. <laughs> and it's not hard. <laughs> Trying to work out the esoteric properties of Hibernate and what it does in weird scenarios is a lot harder than understanding some basic set theory and using these things properly. Yeah, and also think about the other reason why RRMs are a lot of times used. You know, you use it so that you can have a model, which is usually in some specialized language, because you want to avoid SQL, which is a well-understood and well-documented and you know, has actual theory behind it language that's separate, you know, supported by lots of different you know, entities. Does this make sense? I mean, yeah, I've seen SQL statements that are shorter than most you know, data models for ORMs. I love the irony of this. So we've gone through a number of decades of not trying to learn SQL. <laughs> not, avoiding set theory. We have brought in Hibernate, Toplink, all sorts of other stuff. And we've come around to Java 8, and we introduced streams. Guess what streams are? Set theory. Mm -hmm. We've spent decades avoiding it, and then we get it. And we're told that this is the way to do stuff. The irony is just so thick in this, and people aren't even realizing. Then you come on to one of my favorite topics at the moment. Oh, yes, functional programming. What is the biggest issue with functional programming? Any volunteers? Biggest issue in functional programming? Functional programmers. programmers. <laughs> and, and to be fair, this is not just simply for functional programming. There are lots of different things where this could apply, but it just so happens that this seems to be systematic in, you know, in the functional programming community. 
it just the elitism that seems to be attached with functional programming just seems to be so bizarre that's out there. The, the superiority, and you can see this so much. And like, so people sort of study uh, functional programming in university. We had this really good quote from last year where you kind of you do all the basic courses and then you get a choice. Because when you complete all the basic courses, you realize the next thing you're going to do is solve the performance issues because functional has got some serious performance issues, especially if you want to be completely pure. So you've got a fork in the road here, and what you can do is you can go to the courses where you learn how to do the right things and use the compiler and use the systems in the right way, or you go to the other course, which is 101 abusing people online. <laughs> and this seems to be the way most functional programmers go. And if you look at some of the forums, it is just staggering. Some of the things that are said, the abuse of nature and the put-downs and attacks, some of these guys could be the warm-up act for Gamergate. It's just ridiculous. And we keep hearing things like, functional programming is going to solve the multi-core problem. I've got a simple question to that. How? How does functional programming solve the multi-core problem? And usually one of the things that gets thrown back is software transactional memory. Well, guess what? It's a field experiment. One of the things we, we've got to learn from agile feedback cycles, everything, is where's the experiment and show me the proof that it actually makes a difference. Because remember this graph? You use software transactional memory, that red line is coming to get you. And notice, it actually gets worse. I mean, we're at the point now where 32-core you know, pro processors are you know, very attainable. And as that keeps going, it actually gets worse. So if we were to say, hey, if, you know, software transactional memory is awesome, we're going to be using it, we'd be on the wrong side of this and just wondering why. Yeah. If anybody wants to come and chat about this, I'm very happy to talk, but basically, if you increase the complexity of the model, the number of the threads or the size of the search space that you're dealing with, you will keep going further down that red line. It is not the answer. In fact, it goes the wrong way. And what's even worse is a lot of the data structures and stuff under this have no mechanical sympathy. They don't respect the access patterns of CPUs. They do lots of pointer chasing, lots of data-dependent loads. They just do not perform in how they work. And so when people say this is all great, there's a lot to be said about it. And so with the sort of bashing out of the way, the other thing is, there's actually great brilliance in functional programming. So I like to bash it, but I also like to use it. <laughs> and I like to bash it because of the dogma and religion that's around it, not because of that it's fundamentally wrong. Just like anything, there is no perfect solution that solves every single problem. There's some good bits, there's some bad bits, some bits that are appropriate, some bits that are not appropriate. There is some genuine brilliance, and I would recommend anybody who does a lot of imperative or procedural programming to go learn functional programming. You will become a much better programmer, and there's lots of great stuff in there. Just leave the dogma aside and leave the superiority aside, because that's not a good way to be working. And collaboration is a great thing, because you know, bringing things from different disciplines and different points of view, and we'll touch on this in a little while as well, is really a strength. You know, so, you know, while we bash it a little bit, you know, we both actually do a lot of functional programming, you know, in our, in our way. We, you know, get rid of a lot of shared state. We get rid of a lot of state that we have to hang around. We see what we can do without having to have a lot of state around. And also, too, some of the data structures that we've used, especially in Aaron, have been very much influenced by functional programming. Yeah, some great pro persistent data structures are wonderful things. We need much more research on how to make persistent data structures performant then we're in a really good world. And unless people admit what some of the issues are with the structures, we'll never get to the performance side. And we need support from our runtimes and support from our compilers to do this well. And this actually leads straight into the other thing. is like this whole dogma about we'll throw hardware at the problem. I keep seeing this. This is something that's starting to wear incredibly thin now. We can't just keep throwing hardware at the problem. Because if you're it sloppy, it's free lunch overtime. Yeah, we can't, we can't be sloppy anymore because Moore's Law is, is still continuing, but it's continuing in a different direction than we anticipated. So throwing hardware at it, you know, doesn't, make it, doesn't make, necessarily make things faster unless it's been designed in the right way to take advantage of that hardware. Look, here's a simple example. Inside our modern CPUs, when we're processing instructions, we have an L0 cache. Most people are probably aware of their L1, L2, L3. Not aware that there's actually an L0. The purpose of why we've got an L0 is not for performance. It's for power saving. 
So our hardware friends are constantly trying to save energy and how they're working. So rather than going out to the outer caches, they've got this small cache of decoded operations so they don't have to keep decoding instructions over and over again. And there's only 1,500 decoded operations can be in there as micro ops. If your loops fit into that, you get much better performance than if they don't. In fact, after that, there's even smaller buffers with the loop branch buffers that can only hold 28 micro ops. And if you don't fit into that, your loops won't go quite as fast as they could do. And there's also other little things, like you can only have eight branches in a loop, you can't have a return, and you can't have an exception in the loop to take advantage of those loop branch buffers. The great thing is, if you write simple, composable code, it goes really, really fast. So if you've got a loop to do a purpose, quite often it's worthwhile going over a set of data once and doing the action, and then going over it again and doing another action rather than trying to do the two at the same time. That may seem counterintuitive. Quite often, that is the faster solution. It's also mm -hmm. easier to test, easier to reason about, all really simple. I am ruthless when it comes to separation of concerns, single responsibility principle, these sorts of things. Anybody who's ever worked with me will know I almost get crazy about it, but it makes so, so much easier to understand, so much less complex. It also typically makes it faster. There's some times where it won't, and you need a measure to find that out, but you should do it based upon measurement. I keep seeing people like lump code in, like, oh, I'm passing this data, so I'll do it anyway. That will be faster. Just the assumption of that will be faster, adding complexity for a broken assumption. That should only ever be done based on measurement. So code should be as simple as we can make it and no simpler and it should be composable. We should do very simple things. This is actually one of the things that functional programming does talk about, mm -hmm. you know, making these things very simple, making them very composable. But it goes beyond that. You know, even good object-oriented design has simple and composable at its heart. Yeah. Here's another scary picture. This is your typical cache subsystem in one of our modern servers. Within a core, we have layers of caches. We've got that little L0 cache up there at the top. All of this. The scary picture is not that you need to know. This is the important thing that comes around to understanding abstractions. It's not understanding that detail. It's what abstractions does this have to use it right. And what you've got to learn is the patterns of access really matter and locality really matters in your code. So what does that mean? Well, if you go through data structures in a predictable way, the hardware can prefetch it for you. If you're going to use stuff together, keep it together. So one of the things that I've done a lot when I get to understand code bases, I come into a company that's got, say, a performance problem. One of the first things I want to do is actually measure everything, but also get a feel for how it all works and understand it. Typically, you get a feel for it is I'll go through and I'll refactor a code base. Refactoring is usually a way I get to understand stuff. And I'll find this feature envy and fields are in the wrong classes or in the wrong structures in C or wherever it happens to be. And so I'll just go on a tidy and exercise. Like, this property's been accessed from that class all the time. It should be across there. And I'll sort of basically refine the model to do that and just make stuff simpler and easier to understand. And usually run a performance test after that again just to see what difference it makes. On complex projects, I typically find I get about a 30% improvement in performance just by doing that exercise. Cleaning things up. And why has that made a difference? Because things that you use together are kept together. Mm -hmm. Whenever you've got the fields in the same structure that are used together, they're typically in the same cache line and in the same OS page. And these things start to really matter and add up. They give you nice, simple, clean code, but also they're fast. The way that, you know, I mentioned that the way Moore's law has gone is kind of different than we expected. Processor speeds, they haven't changed very much in, in several years. Bandwidth, in all kinds of different ways, has been following Moore's law. Latency has not. You know, speed of light is not only a good idea, it is the law. Latency isn't going to get much better. It doesn't matter if you're talking about networks that are on chip, networks that are you know, spread out all over the world. Bandwidth, though, and capacity increases, which does mean that how you take advantage of it is, going, is different. Designs have to be slightly different than they were previously, because if they're not, they can't take advantage of the hardware. So if you put some hardware in it, throwing it at it, you see no change. Mm -hmm. It's not just memory. You'll find this pattern repeats on many different scales. You'll find so many things in our industry are fractal. So it's network bandwidth, the storage capacity, memory capacity, number of cores. 
but the response time for many things don't make much change because physics is coming into it. You need to be aware that, that this, this stuff really, really matters. Like we're looking at CPUs per core are probably getting five to 10% faster per generation. Networks are doubling or even going up an order of magnitude between generations. That bandwidth stuff is just changing so much. I still see people compressing data on a local LAN. And you think, why? You're wasting all that CPU time, and this network isn't even coming close to being used correctly. So being aware of what matters. So what does this mean for software? And I kind of like to use an analogy for this. Airbus, they make the A320, which is the best-selling aircraft of all time. There's more of these been sold to airlines all around the world. They typically make around about two a day or 42 a month, depending on their production line to how they're going. Yet it takes two months from order to delivery when they go to build these things. There's about 100,000 person hours in building an aircraft from scratch. How do they deliver two a day when it takes over two months to build them? Their pipeline. And what you're doing is you break the thing up into stages and you have the pipeline continue going. And if they want even more bandwidth, they have multiple pipelines going. So they have three pipelines, one in Europe, one in China, one in the US. And they're doing this. And there's a lot to be learned from this. Like this whole shared mutable state and working on stuff and how complex it is and how difficult it is to understand, it is a heck of a lot easier to deal with pipelines. Where you don't contend on data, you do the same task over repeatedly, which CPUs are brilliant at, because they're hot in cash for instructions, for data, for whatever they're doing, and you just pipeline it through, and you can get throughput. If you look at most hardware, it's all pipelining solutions. That's how we even process instructions. So let's learn from others, let's build on the shoulders of giants, and sort of do things at scale like this. A better way to think about it is stop thinking about your code. Think about flows of data and transformations that you do to data. It makes your code a lot simpler, a lot more elegant, a lot more performant in how it works. Last subject we're going to tackle here is something that you know, Martin and I feel pretty strongly about. And there's actually quite a few people that do as well. It's about diversity in, in our industry. Um, we're not a very diverse group. You know, but it's even worse than we think. Yeah. I think a lot of the previous problems that we have are the result of this. We suffer from an interesting form of TDD. And it's the most obvious one where we've got a diversity problem. There's also <coughs> other diversity problems. There's other diversity problems on many levels that we have not even touch on. But I want to show some stuff because we've got some real data on this here. And it's, it's kind of fascinating. And it shows how we've restricted some of our thinking. This is an interesting survey showing of a number of graduates from different programs that are female. So if you look at that graph, the red line is computer science. And, and this graph should scare the hell out of you. It certainly scares me uh, because, you know, there's, when we start to think the same and we start to, you know, not challenge, you know, uh, except in an alpha male type of way, you know, we really restrict what kind of solutions we come with, up with. And that means that the innovation that we have in our industry starts to decrease. And so with that decrease in that line, we should also think of that as that's potentially going to stall this as an industry at some point. Yeah. That, that's actually continued down again. That plateau was actually a good thing that it's actually got worse and stuff. And that red line is mirrored in engineering and mathematics as well. But if you look at things like law, medicine, all sorts of other difficult subjects, we're, we're approaching 50%. It's the right thing what we should be seeing. So we've got a fundamental problem here. This was from Carnegie Mellon who'd done this study. And what they find was fascinating. So they went back to the 60s and then they went to 1984 where that turned out happens. This happened in 1984. What they discovered was when people were coming to university, some people were starting the course. And some people done really well, and some people done terribly. And the ones who done terribly tended to drop out. And a lot of these people who done terribly, done amazing in high school, like took top in their class in mathematics, top in their class in different sciences. And some of the people who done really well weren't necessarily those sorts of people. So they interviewed them all. They, went, they interviewed right through the couple of decades to find out what had happened. And what they discovered was there was this concept of what they called the haves and the have-nots. 
And around the beginning of the 1980s, we started seeing the personal computer being available and people having computers at home. And the haves were the people who grew up with the computer at home. And whenever they went on these computer science programs, they had already got the, the basics of programming, so they were, got a leg up and they could go quite quickly. What also they discovered was the marketing around all of this was targeted at white male teenage boys. And as a result, they got the computers and all the rest lost out. And things like Tandy and other places where Radio Shack were marketing out this group and we ended up with, these, with this problem. So when we got to university, these people were doing really well and everybody else was struggling. So Carnegie Mellon had an experiment. They found out if people had this experience by computing at home and those who didn't. And the ones who didn't, they put them on a foundational course and brought them up to the same sort of level. Guess what, two to three years later on the people who completed the foundation course, the dropout rates were the same. They were coping perfectly fine and everybody was doing equally well. And this has been repeated in a number of other universities. So it's kind of interesting in how we've got into that. What was fascinating was actually the media we think has caused a lot of this. Because the media targeted these, and I don't know whether it was deliberate or not, but they targeted these white male teenagers with the marketing to get those computers we need to somehow influence the media. I think we've got a bigger problem with the media. Like, why do people go into medicine? Why do they go into law? All these smart people going into these things because we've got TV shows that make them sexy subjects to go into. And most of the tech-related stuff yeah. is the dorks and the geeks, and it's all not very appealing. So we, that's a, something we can't really fix, but I think it's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot we learn from this. So, so you know... Yeah. Let's think about this for a moment. We have actually have quite a few extremely impressive role models, you know, as women within our field. Grace Hopper. She basically postulated distributed computing. She also invented COBOL, and she also invented the compiler. I mean, every language owes her a debt, right? Every language designer owes her a huge debt, you know, and. Well, she was also an admiral in the U.S. Navy, too. I mean, it's a pretty good career. Yeah, but we're going to have to burn her with Tim because she did create COBOL. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But she's not only the only one. Let me ask you a question. Um, who do you think coined the term software engineering? Who do you think came up with the idea of end-to-end -end testing? Anybody know who came up with the idea of priority scheduling? volunteers on that. Kind of interesting. This amazing woman came up with a lot of those things. So Google recently attacked end-to-end -end testing, which I think was a completely bogus thing because they're obviously not doing it right. This is the person who came up with end-to-end -end testing. This is the person who came up with priority scheduling. Margaret Hamilton. She wrote the software for the Apollo 11 space shuttle, or the spaceship that went down on the lander. Went down and she led a lot of software development. She was the director of software at NASA up until 89 and done some really, really cool stuff. And so about the diversity of thinking and different ways of doing stuff. So here's a really good example. Whenever the lander was going down on Apollo 11, the bulk of the software was written by her. There was some other software that was doing radar guidance, not written by her, that was controlled by a switch and the astronauts accidentally turned this switch on. And it started eating up a lot of CPU cycles and started generating errors. Remember when I said who invented priority scheduling? She did. Because what she had done is she had foreseen that these things could possibly happen, and if they do happen, she wanted to back off her software to do the absolute minimum but make sure it had priority to do what it must absolutely do, like land this craft. So this is one of the reasons they survived, was she invented priority scheduling and got that right. And actually, I think, now we understand priority scheduling, I doubt there'd be many men would have come up with that, but she came up with that, because women are great at collaboration. Mm. We're missing out on some of those diverse options that are there, so there's a lot to be learned, and I think there's a lot we can do here. And I started my career actually in software safety, you know, at doing, working as a researcher with NASA, and her, contributions actually, you know, and I didn't know this for, until recently, but her contributions actually did influence 
how software and the safety around software was looked at within NASA. And, you know, so we, we, we owe, you know, this woman of a huge debt, as well as Grace Hopper. And there's lots of others. Personally, I know of two different women who influenced my career, you know, qu quite a bit, Nancy Levinson and Sally Floyd. They're in two different disciplines. One is in software engineering. The other one is actually in networking as a physicist. And the reason why they influenced was because of their work, right? And I think if you think about it, you probably know of a woman, you know, within, uh, you know, software that has actually influenced you as well, whether it be an instructor or it be a researcher or it actually just be a colleague. Yeah, I've been the same thing as well. We, we kind of both believe in this passionately. When I studied computer science, one of my majors was parallel concurrent systems. It's something I do a lot now, today. That was taught to me by Mary Schnapcott. She was the first female to do a PhD in University of Cambridge in England. And she really struggled to get through and get done that. Absolutely brilliant, but also inspiring woman to sort of teach some of this stuff. But the scary thing is we seem to be keeping those out now. We've got to make sure we don't have that happen. So one of the interesting things that has kind of come out to address this, people have talked about the fake it till you make it, because basically so many men just fake it. They're full of bullshit. And they kind of get away with it and do it. And so it's been recommended that some women take a similar approach to this. The famous article, Fake It, You Make It, you can go and read it. I think that is actually fundamentally not addressing the problem. We should admit what the problem is and deal with it. And that's yep. actually, yep. most of us don't know what we're doing. And we need to learn and we need to work stuff out. So stop faking it and let's work out what we need to do. And Dave Farley, who's a good friend of mine, he came up with this law. I remember meeting him about 20 years ago and was working with him. He told me about Farley's law. And like, as soon as you realize most people don't know what they're doing, the world makes a whole lot more sense. We kind of went separate ways. We worked on different things. And then we got together again whenever we worked on LMAX. And I said, Dave, how's Farley's law going? And he says, yeah, I've kind of refined it. People are shit. <laughs> and it is true. But we just got to admit that. We got to admit that. We got to learn. We got to do things better. We got to do these things and you know, how we do things. And part of it is how we need to look at how we train programmers, how we deal with it. Like coaching and apprenticeships are a kind of interesting thing I think we need to do. We need to build on those really solid foundations and stop making a lot of the mistakes that we have done from the past. And to quote something from Grace Hopper herself, like her most important achievement in her mind is not just the compiler, but what she did for, for training the young people. And there's another quote from her, which was like, uh, sort of later on in her career, and she's sort of reflecting back. And she said, you know, people constantly come into it, like, you think you can do this. She says, like, she said, try it. And you've got to back them up. And then you've got to challenge them. You've got to come back to it and do this right. So we've got to get into this sort of culture much better and thinking of ways of doing it. So kind of quickly in closing, I kind of got a question of what we think are the greatest achievements of the human race. Between Todd and I, we come up with two that we kind of believe in. One is the scientific method. And that's fundamentally about how we learn and we deal things with experimental evidence. And the great quote for me on this is uh, Richard Feynman's. And he says, it doesn't matter how smart or how intelligent you are, if you make a guess, and that guess cannot be backed up by experimental evidence, it is still a Just guess. That is how we should be thinking about building software and building on the solid foundations. The other thing. Yeah, and the second one is the understanding of evolution, right? There's a lot of things that actually come out of this that we see that systems evolve. We see that they can start out fragile and then get hard, you know, more hardened and you know, become anti-fragile over time. You know, these things, you know, the, just the evolution and learning experience you know, has tremendous you know, advantages to it. You know, something doesn't work, we try certain things, we harden it, now it does work, and it, and it becomes much more adaptable. So these things, you know, we, we see this, we do this all the time, you know, and, and it is kind of a side effect of evolution. Yeah, so it's down to that point, is like the adaptability, the diversity is what really matters in getting that right. But don't worry about it so much. Like, yeah, we've talked a lot about we screw up stuff, but I kind of think we're living in the era of software alchemy. This is like going back a couple of hundred years ago in many of the other physical sciences. We're kind of working this out. So fine, let's work it out. The great thing is, it's a fascinating and brilliant time to be doing this. And we should do cool stuff. And don't accept the crap. Just don't follow the herd. Don't do the CV, resume-driven development nonsense that we keep doing. Do the cool stuff and try to do it right. And have fun with it. Because it's one of the best jobs you can have out here. And on that, we'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you.